Okay, so greetings everyone uh, and good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on uh, whichever time zone you are coming from. My name is Jan Kašparek and I'm an international PR officer in the Czech-based NGO Arnica. And I'm very pleased to welcome you today to the webinar Waste Incineration and the Triple Planetary Crisis. And first, a few technicalities. The webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes. After my very short introduction, there will be four presentations of about 10 minutes each, after which we will answer questions from you, our dear listeners. Also, please note that we are recording the webinar for a future publication. So, uh, this event is being held on the occasion of the yesterday's publication of the report uh, Waste Incineration and the Environment by Arnica, the Center for Environmental Justice and Development in Kenya, Center of Research and Education for Development in Cameroon, Toxics Free Australia, and the International Pollutants Elimination Network, or IPAN. This is a really comprehensive report summarizing the issue of waste incineration in almost 300 pages. So you can study it at, uh, let's say, more relaxed pace after the webinar. I'll send you a link to freely download and read the report on ResearchGate in the chat now and before the end of our webinar. So what can we exact, uh, actually learn from this uh, report? For example, about how communities living near incinerators may be at higher risk of health issues, that uh, both fly ash and bottom ash from incinerators are highly contaminated with dioxins and other chemicals such as PFAS, or that the emissions to air from incinerators are not fully controlled, as some very toxic substances are monitored for only a few hours twice a year or not measured at all. The report also shows us that uh, incinerators are generally not able to operate without public funding or other forms of public support. And of course, uh, the study also looks at alternatives and describes several examples of these. In addition to reviewing all the science around waste incineration, the report also presents a number of case studies from around the world, showing mainly the failures of incineration and its threats to human health, public health, and the environment in general. As we are living in a time of the triple planetary crisis, that is climate change, widespread pollution, and the loss of biodiversity, it's also important to openly say that waste incineration doesn't come as a solution from this research, just the opposite. The current way of incinerating waste actually contributes to the triple crisis by releasing volumes of carbon dioxide and polluting the environment with a variety of toxic chemicals, including uh, dioxins, mercury, and many others in quantities which are clearly exceeding planetary crisis, uh, limits. This triple planetary crisis and the connection of waste incineration to climate change will be the subject of uh, the first presentation of the webinar, by my colleague Nikola Jelinek, an expert on toxic substances in the environment from our Czech-based NGO, Arnica. Afterwards, Indrik Petrlík, also from Arnica, an expert on toxic substances in waste and the environment, and an IPAN steering committee member, will talk about specific chemical threats resulting from waste incineration and the related problem of biodiversity loss. The third presentation will be given by Jane Bremer, Chair of Toxics Free Australia and Campaign Coordinator for Zero Waste Australia. She will outline the chapters in the report and the relevance and importance of this study for environmental justice, communities which are being impacted, and the health impacts associated with the topic. The final presentation will belong to IPEN Steering Committee member, a founder of Center for Environmental Justice and Development, Griffins Ocheng, who will address uh, the issue of waste incineration in the context of African countries and the so-called Global South in general. After those four presentations, there will be a significant amount of 
time in the webinar for questions for our speakers. And I would uh, like to ask you to post those questions of yours into the webinars chat during the presentations. We will, or I will continuously gather them to be answered after the presentations. Uh, of course, uh, we hope that uh, there will be enough space for all of the questions, but if not, we'll answer particularly particularly interesting and serious questions in the form of an online document that uh, we'll send you afterwards. And now, uh, to not make it so very long, I will uh, finally turn the floor over to Nikola. And I wish you all an inspiring listening to the presentations, during which I will collect your questions for answering after the speeches. Thank you. Thank you, Honza. Uh, can you just uh, tell me if you can see my presentation and if you can hear me well? Yeah, yeah. everything. Okay. Wow, wonderful. Uh, thank you for your brief inter introduction. Um, I am going to talk about waste incineration, climate change, and the triple planetary crisis. My name is Nikola Jelinek, and I'm expert on toxic substances this is in Arnica Toxics and Waste Program, as Honza, uh, as Jan said before, we are based in Czechia, but I do a lot of things also outside Czechia. I do uh, a lot of environmental sampling. I write reports on this with my colleagues. And uh, in Czech Republic, I am very interested into um, waste incineration. That's why I also, um, that's why I am one of the co-authors of this study. Uh, I bet that you, you all uh, have heard of uh, climate change, but it, it is only part of the problem that is happening right now on this planet. Because uh, our planet is only one and, and has some kind of boundaries, uh, which were identified in, 19, uh, in 2009. Uh, you can see them on the, on the picture uh, in my slide. It's uh, climate change, ocean acid acidification, uh etc um seven of them uh, were uh, quantified in this year and three of them were exceeded it's biodiversity loss uh, climate change and nitrogen 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 cycle the green color uh, should not be exceeded uh, to avoid harmful or even catastrophic effects on the planet this is why is it so important but uh, as time went uh in 2015, uh, one more uh, boundary was crossed, and in 2023, two more uh, boundaries were assessed and two more uh, were crossed. One of those uh, newly crossed boundaries was for novel entities, which means man-made chemicals, but also uh, plastics or heavy metals. They all do have uh, in common that they have been introduced into the environment by human activity, and this is going to be uh, the main part of the presentation of the next speaker of my colleague, Indrich. Uh, uh, how, how does it relate to waste incineration? Uh, because waste incinerators uh, release toxic substances into the air, into wastewater and into solid residues. Uh, why do, do I talk about uh, carbon uh, climate change and waste incineration? because waste contains uh, carbon of both biogenic and fossil origin, because uh, municipal waste contains uh, plastics which are made from petroleum. The ratio of the fossil and bio, uh, biogenic uh, carbon is 50-50, uh, as you can see on the chart uh, on the right side. It's uh, an, an example from two waste, uh, waste to energy uh, facilities in Czech Republic. Uh, the red, uh, the red part of the bar uh, stands for fossil uh, carbon dioxide, and the green one for bio biogenic carbon dioxide. <clears throat> you can see that is uh, it's somewhere around fifty fifty. Uh, problem is that uh, uh, in uh, next next to that there is some kind uh, a lot of fossil uh, carbon dioxide emissions that. Also, the, bio, uh, the carbon dioxide emission, emissions of biogenic origin are not normally taken into account when assessing the climate impact of a waste to energy or waste incinerator. Uh, and it's a problem because uh, in European Union, uh, you can see uh, in this chart, you can see trends in municipal waste management, and you can see that the pink part is, uh, is growing. 
and uh, and uh, which means that the waste which is incinerated in the European U Union is steadily increasing. In 2017, it was 27 percent, which means that uh, carbon dioxide emissions also increase with the amount of waste which is incinerated. On this chart, it is the blue uh, blue line. I have only data for from uh, to uh, to two thousand seventeen, but those uh, those facilities produce uh, electricity, right? Yeah, uh, but here you can see uh, uh, another chart. You can see uh, greenhouse gas emissions intensity of electricity generation. Uh, this is chart which tells us uh, how how much carbon dioxide is uh, released uh, per one kilowatt hour of energy. You can see that in 2021, it was uh, in European Union, it was 338 grams of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent uh, per one kilowatt hour. But, uh, and uh, the average carbon intensity is decreasing over time because fossil fuels are displaced by re uh, by renewable uh, energy sources, with, which has very low or zero uh, global global warming potential. But uh, this is only example uh, uh, how um, how can fossil carbon intensity of energy uh, can look in uh, in incinerators in United Kingdom, and you can see that it's a far higher than the average uh, 238 in uh, in European Union. Uh, sometimes it's twice, sometimes it's three times. Uh, there is uh, another question if uh, incinerators do reduce CO, uh, CO2 carbon dioxide production. Uh, in some cases they do, but only uh, in comparison with uh, landfills. If you compare it to recycling and composting, they, they don't. Uh, that's why uh, those uh, bars are going to the left uh, instead of right for landfill and incineration. And they definitely do not uh, do not uh, reduce uh, carbon dioxide production in comparison with, with waste prevention. So uh, what is going to be our future? Um, we, we know from the study from the last year that in 2050, we are going to have really a uh, big problem with burning plastic waste because burning plastic waste is going to generate more carbon dioxide um, emissions than burning fossil fuels. And uh, that's why we know that converting plastic waste, which is part of uh, municipal waste into energy is a problem which will not uh, which should not and will not replace burning coal because it it's uh, it's not clean um and the last thing that is uh together that is go that we have to uh count in is, is that newly built waste incinerator can be expected to be in service for 20 or 30 years uh and the construction of these facilities delays the transition to less or zero carbon intensive renewable energy generation and also cost a lot of money. Uh, in general, you can say uh, that over time, waste incineration will have more negative and more significant impact on climate change than, than it currently does. This is only... Uh, uh, Little reminder that the construction of waste incinerator facilities supports the situation in this picture, which can be seen uh, many times also in Europe and etc. Uh, my last slide uh, is uh, the um, the introduction to the fourth chapter of the study, which is uh, on incinerators and the planetary ecosystem, where you can find more information about. Uh, what I was talking about. Thank you for your attention. That's all from my side. Oh, thank you, Nicola, okay. for introduction of triple planetary crisis. Uh, I will continue. Uh, uh, Maybe, sorry, sorry, Indrich, uh, to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. We just found out that uh, for some reason people can cannot write into the into the chat. So uh, I want to ask uh, everyone to uh, use instead the questions and uh, answers segment, which you uh, should see 
probably down uh, down on the panel in in Zoom uh, because we are not really sure at the moment how to how to make the the main chat running and we don't want to lose any of your uh, potential questions. So I hope that uh, we'll work out some solution uh, during the next presentation. And again, sorry for this interruption. And now feel free to go to you, Indrich. OK, sorry. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I will uh, continue uh, the presentation started by uh, Nicola. My name is Indrich Petrlik, and I work with Arnica Association as uh, Program Director in Toxic and Waste Program. And at the same time, I work as an uh, expert on dioxin and POPs based with International Pollutants Elimination Network, which is a network of more than uh, 600 civil society organizations in over 125 countries. Uh, and I deal with um, uh, uh, mainly persistent organic uh, pollutants a uh, long time uh, with this network and I would like to share with you uh, some uh, important parts of uh, our uh, report on waste incineration and uh, the environment. Uh, I will talk about uh, the crisis uh, on the chemical pollution which is called uh, novel entities in uh, uh, in uh, evaluation of uh, uh, crossing uh, uh, Earth planet uh, boundaries. I will continue then on the biodiversity loss and I will tackle also biogeochemical bio flows. In uh, 2022, a uh, group of scientists uh, published uh, this uh, important uh, study uh, and they uh, uh, concluded that chemical pollution uh, has uh, crossed uh, or exceeded planetary boundary of uh, planet Earth. Um, since uh, uh, that time, uh, we already talked about uh, uh, climate change crisis and biodiversity crisis. We then started to, to talk about triple planetary crisis. If you look at the uh, waste incineration or waste incinerators as such, uh, we uh, can see that they release uh, uh, chemicals uh, and uh, plastics via several pathways, not only air emissions, which are most uh, uh, part of the discussions about uh, waste incineration influence on the environment, but also in uh, waste incineration residues. Uh, like air pollution control residues uh, or uh, bottom ash. Uh, these uh, residues sometimes are carried to quite far distances from waste incinerator and they can influence the environment in these locations. This photo is, for example, from Taiwan, where bottom ash was uh, stored just next to the ponds where uh, fishermen catch um, uh, the fish uh, and the chemicals can be carried to long distances also uh, on particulate matters released into the air. This is uh, uh, one of the photos uh, which we included in our report showing uh, such a particulate matter on which some chemicals can be bound and are bound in, in reality. If we look at the plastics, uh, uh, and mainly nanoplastic and microplastic, uh, someone could think that high temperatures uh, under which uh, most of incinerators operate, all plastic should be destroyed. But the reality is quite different, as we saw, for example, in uh, mixed bottom ash and fly ash from a uh, municipal waste incinerator in the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, you can see it on this picture. And a recent study uh, found out that uh, uh, after sampling and analysis of 31 ash samples from 16 modern waste incinerators, 
uh, up to more than 500 particles of microplastics per kilogram were found, uh, and they uh, estimated that it means uh, uh, release of uh, more than 100,000 particles per ton of incinerated uh, waste. This is uh, part of the text from the report, so we can find more information related to the topic in our report. In 1995, uh, Jay and Stieglitz looked at uh, our emissions from waste incinerator, and they, uh, they found uh, 250 individual compounds at concentrations exceeding 50 nanograms per cubic meter. And uh, they also concluded that it uh, represents only 42% of all organic substances and the remaining 58% uh, 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 consisted of un un unidentified aliphatic hydrocarbons. So it means that if we look at, for example, uh, this list of uh, chemicals, we uh, can see that definitely not all are measured uh, during uh, uh, controlling emissions from waste incinerators. So we definitely uh, can, we, we don't know uh, uh, enough information about uh, our emissions from waste incinerators. Of course, some of them can be controlled by uh, techniques used, for example, for um, uh, uh, dioxins and so on, but definitely not all. If uh, we look at the specific uh, groups of chemicals, uh, we are working long time on persistent organic pollutants, which are uh, um, regulated by the Stockholm Convention. Uh, this is a group of chemicals uh, which is uh, uh, released uh, by waste incinerators uh, in uh, significant amounts and therefore waste incineration was uh, also listed uh, in Annex C as one of uh, important sources of, for example, dioxins and uh, other uh, unintentionally produced uh, persistent organic pollutants. Resistant organic pollutants, unfortunately, uh, stay or last a long time in the environment, uh, uh, and uh, they also uh, accumulate in uh, fatty tissues, and they can um, uh, they biomagnify. It means the highest uh, uh, concentrations can be found in uh, upper parts of food chains. They can influence uh, uh, reproduction ability by uh, prey species like uh, uh, fish uh, prey species or, uh, for example, eagles. So uh, one of the first uh, noticed about uh, uh, the bad influence of uh, pops was uh, eagle. Uh, uh, population in the United States uh, uh, where, where DDT was involved mainly. I will focus only on some of um, uh, chemicals in this group, dioxins, uh, specifically chlorinated dioxins and uh, para- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, uh, there is uh, more uh, discussion about the other POPs in our report, uh, which uh, uh, you can check uh, later on. If you look at the dioxins uh, uh, in modern waste incinerators, uh, they, uh, there are scrubbers uh, to catch dioxins from air emissions. However, they concentrate them in uh, fly ashes or air pollution control residues. And uh, therefore, we try to look at the levels of dioxins in fly ashes from waste incineration globally and in air pollution control residues. And we tried to calculate how much of dioxins is uh, produced. And we came to uh, the number uh, around uh, 15 kilograms TEQ per year, which doesn't seem quite uh, as a large number, but uh, if uh, we 
look at half of this amount, which is suggested to be left without control, as it is not uh, uh, recognized as a hazardous waste according to international conventions. So half of, of that amount is equal to the tolerable dose of dioxins for human population of 133 planets Earth. It's quite enough. And of course, not all the dioxins reach uh, our food chain, but even if a very uh, small amount from that volume of dioxins reach the food chain, it definitely influence uh, the uh, contamination of the food globally. So this is example that dioxins definitely uh, exceeded uh, planetary boundaries as a part of chemical uh, pollution. Why it is so, it's quite uh, uh, easy to explain because dioxins are dangerous in already very low levels in the environment. Uh, they are measured in picograms or nanograms per gram. Uh, so it is like uh, uh, comparing to uh, dissolving a sugar cube in the pool of one square kilometer. So you can imagine it is very, very uh, uh, low uh, concentration, which uh, uh, is considered to be already dangerous or uh, of interest. Um, dioxins uh, at these levels enter the food chain, as uh, I mentioned, and uh, they uh, at these levels already can have very significant health effects like neurotoxicity, reprotoxicity, uh, developmental toxicity. They are endocrine disruptors. Um, uh, uh, some of them are carcinogenic uh, and they are immunotoxic. Uh, how they can uh, get into the, the environment is visible from this picture, which is from uh, the place where fly ash from waste incinerators in the UK is handled. And you can see that um, a lot of dust can uh, get into the surrounding environment together, of course, with concentrated dioxins in it. We uh, try to look at uh, potential contamination of the food chain in uh, uh, the neighborhood of uh, sites where uh, fly ashes uh, from base incineration were not handled in a uh, proper way. And we uh, try to uh, check the levels uh, in a free range chicken eggs, uh, because uh, uh, quite often chicken uh, uh, forage uh, in the surrounding area, and if they have access to uh, areas with fly ash, uh, they can accumulate uh, large uh, uh, levels of dioxins and other pops. And in uh, 2022, we published uh, a global report looking at uh, uh, the levels of dioxin in free range chicken eggs from various hotspots around the globe. And you can see that uh, many uh, from the maximum levels collected uh, globally uh, were influenced by waste uh, incineration, um, including uh, modern waste incinerators, but of course also waste incinerators without uh, uh, any uh, control of air pollution, uh, but uh, in many cases, uh, the, the cause for uh, the pollution of free and chicken eggs was rather uh, storage of uh, uh, fly ash uh, uh, from uh, uh, waste incinerators. Dioxins are not only a chemical which we can uh, see in uh, waste incineration residues. This is uh, uh, division of various uh, heavy metals and some persistent organic pollutants in various uh, waste incineration residues. You can find this graph also in our report. And you can see that dioxins, uh, uh, so PCDD slash F, uh, are mainly in fly ash or end product, but it doesn't apply to other OPS like uh, PCBs. 
uh, or also PFASs, which I will talk later on, or brominated auxins, which uh, can be found in bottom ash. Uh, uh, the promotion of recycling of these uh, products of waste incineration, we can see then as promotion of kind of toxic recycling because uh, unfortunately it's uh, not very well controlled regarding uh, uh, the, the chemicals uh, in uh, recycled uh, materials which are used as construction materials. Let me to move on uh, to uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl uh, substances, which is a quite large group of chemicals, so several thousands. Uh, only a small part is now under uh, the control of the Stockholm Convention uh, or national legislation, and there was ongoing uh, discussion on uh, banning of these substances as a group uh, and. Um, here is, um, I start from the opposite side with dioxins. I, I in the end talk about uh, the health effects. This picture shows health effects of uh, uh, PFAS. PFAS is, um, uh, and you can see that again, they are uh, endocrine disruptors. Um, they uh, can influence also fertility. So it means they are um, uh, in some way uh, repro uh, reprotoxic uh, chemicals. Uh, they increase risk of kidney cancer and uh, they have m more uh, health effects. Uh, if uh, we look at the PFASs and waste incineration, there was a number of studies, mainly from a Swedish group of scientists uh, led by Sophie Bjerklund uh, published since uh, 2021, uh, uh, and these studies uh, mapped uh, the flow of PFAS uh, through waste incineration. They found uh, PFAS uh, uh, also in air emissions as well as in waste incineration residues. Uh, we included major uh, uh, outcomes or major uh, conclusions of all these uh, reports in in uh, our report, so you can find more there. This is a more or very recent uh, study of uh, the group of uh, scientists from uh, Czechia and Denmark, which looked at the PFASs in waste incineration residues, especially in bottom ash and one of their uh, conclusion is that uh, uh, the emissions uh, uh, through leaching of PFAS can be equivalent of uh, 152 grams uh, PFOA equivalents per 10 or 20 years from using 550 tons, uh, thousand tons of um, uh, municipal incineration bottom ash is construction material, which is often practiced in Denmark. Uh, it starts to be practiced in the Czech Republic and in some other countries. Uh, here is uh, quite uh, in, uh, a good uh, illustration about the flow of PFASs in Waste incinerators um, uh, by Bjerg Kund uh, in one of the reports uh, which I mentioned. I, uh, I hope you allow me not to go through all these details. You can find this uh, uh, graph uh, in, in our report, uh, or you can find it, of course, in the original source uh, by Bjerg Kund and Al. But you can see that. Uh, uh, the waste incineration can be a very significant source of PFAS uh, uh, because uh, grams for PFAS, uh, gram releases per year for PFAS is, is already quite a significant uh, uh, amount. Uh, for those who are interested, uh, what um, uh, uh, PFASs can be uh, found uh, specifically in waste incineration flows. Uh, here is the, the graph showing uh, uh, 
presentation of uh, various prefaces in uh, uh, Flugas uh, uh, and uh, also in uh, reduce or processing uh, water. Uh, the overall uh, conclusion by uh, uh, this study by Berklund uh, et al. from 2023 is that uh, they found mainly short chain P PFCAs uh, uh, along with P4, PFDA, and PFBS, uh, but those were uh, often below or close to level of quanti quantification. And what is interesting that uh, they think that uh, the, the uh, PFASIS can be uh, a result of the presence of precursors in a waste, so they can be generated during waste incineration process, or uh, some of them are simply uh, not destroyed PFASIS from the original waste. Uh, our team uh, looked at the uh, uh, parent polyfluoroalkyl substances in waste incineration residues from various um, uh, uh, parts of the world, uh, and we took examples in waste incinerator uh, in Philippines, Thailand, um, Czechia, and also uh, at the, some construction site in Netherlands. Uh, and this is the result. You can see that we found uh, them in uh, various levels, uh, starting 0.02 nanograms per gram diameter up to uh, several tens nanograms uh, per gram of uh, diameter. And Philippines, in Philippines, that waste incinerator burns a lot of uh, medical waste, what can be a potential source of uh, uh, PFAS is because medical uh, waste can contain uh, significant amounts of uh, 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 PFAS. Uh, we will uh, represent, we will present uh, the results of our study at upcoming dioxin conference this year. This is um, uh, uh, that uh, study which we submitted, and uh, it will be presented later uh, this September in uh, uh, Singapore. Here is comparison about the levels of uh, PFAS in uh, various uh, waste incineration uh, residues. So you can see that the, they vary between um, uh, several uh, tens uh, of uh, uh, nanograms uh, per gram up to uh, uh, almost uh, 90 nanograms uh, per gram diameter. Uh, and uh, they were found not only in bottom ash, but also in fly ash, as you can see uh, in the Chinese study. Uh, you can find this uh, table in uh, our new study, which will be uh, published at the Dioxin Conference, as I mentioned. Uh, Air emissions um, or uh, uh, emissions to water or waste incineration residues are not only uh, <clears throat> pathways uh, of chemicals into the environment. Unfortunately, there are uh, some uh, accidents in waste incinerators during which uh, uh, significant amounts of uh, uh, chemicals can be released uh, uh, into the environment. Uh, of course, uh, as in the case of uh, uh, fires at uh, industrial sites as well, but uh, someone uh, could uh, uh, not await uh, uh, that uh, uh, such accidents happen so often as it's, uh, it is reality, which uh, we try to show also in the map, uh, which is available on uh, our website, and uh, you can find the link in the report. Let me to move on to biodiversity uh, uh, loss, uh, how waste incineration can influence biodiversity. Again, it can be through the uh, promotion of the use of uh, waste incineration residues as construction materials, as is visible on um, this picture 
on the right side uh, where his bottom ash uh, in Netherlands used for uh, building roads and bottom ash very often contains high levels of zinc. Zinc is not toxic for men, but it is very toxic for uh, uh, aquatic organisms. So getting zinc uh, out of control in the environment can uh, damage um, uh, uh, biodiversity by loss of uh, some aquatic organisms. Another way is, uh, again, through the using uh, waste incineration residues like fly ash in uh, the uh, landfill uh, where they try to build from uh, uh, blocks uh, made of uh, uh, fly ash uh, in uh, the marine landfill in Bermuda. Uh, and it was documented that uh, the surrounded area was quite uh, heavily contaminated with uh, toxic chemicals. This is another example uh, where uh, uh, this is uh, the, the island uh, Langoya near Oslo, where most of fly ash from Swedish waste incinerators uh, is uh, uh, stored or uh, uh, processed. And uh, uh, near uh, or neighboring reserve is slowly dying. This is another example how waste incineration can uh, influence uh, biodiversity. And last, uh, larger topic of my presentation is uh, biogeochemical flows. Um, I will talk uh, mainly about phosphorus uh, flow. This is phosphorus cycle uh, uh, on the picture. So um, a lot of uh, Phosphorus is um, mainly in uh, bio-waste uh, and um, uh, waste incineration. Uh, waste incinerators burn out of uh, bio-waste and, and moving uh, bio-waste into waste incinerators into, instead of composting will lead to its loss or to loss of uh, uh, phosphorus sources. Uh, Professor Lars Tomaniansen from the Copenhagen University uh, claims that nearly 10,000 tons of phosphorus are lost in Danish incineration plants, and it corresponds to the annual import of phosphates to Denmark. So, in order to replace lost uh, uh, phosphorus uh, uh, through uh, the waste incineration, as it is shown also on this. Uh, uh, a diagram uh, from one of the studies focused uh, on phosphorus in urban areas. Um, this is an uh, uh, example from Sweden. Uh, so to replace uh, the lost uh, phosphorus sources, uh, we have to mine uh, phosphates. Um, and this, these pictures are from the place where the phosphates are mined in Western Sahara. So you can see that um, uh, it's, uh, this uh, uh, operation has also influence on the environment. Uh, this is my very, I know, very fast dive in, in, into many uh, issues, uh, but you can learn more in our report. Uh, we tried to focus on topics related to triple planetary crisis, and you can download the report uh, on any of these links which I show. Thank you for your attention and uh, pass the floor to next speaker. Thank you, Yindrik, and I think that's me. I'm just going to uh, share my screen now. Here we go. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation to join this webinar today. 
Um, I first want to acknowledge that I'm, I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Noongar Nation here in Perth, Western Australia, in the city of Borloo, um, the home for the Swan River people here in, in, in Australia. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, just a, a summary of the report and the uh, chapters that are included in this report and why it's so important for environmental justice communities. But at first, a little bit about Toxics Free Australia. Um, this is uh, some of the issues that we're working on here in, in, in Australia, uh, particularly um, for our work towards a toxics free circular economy and advancing the global environmental health movement. Um, you may have uh, known us previously uh, through the National Toxics Network and the Alliance for a Clean Environment. Both those organisations have retired now and we've resurfaced as Toxics for Australia to carry on that really important work, uh, which is really important right now. Um, we work collaboratively with uh, fantastic organisations like Hanukkah and all the other participating organisations in IPEN and other organisations around the world working in this space, including um, Zero Waste Europe, the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives and all the other good people on the planet here who are working for our, our shared survival on this planet um, and an end to uh, overconsumption and the pollution of the planet and zero waste policies. So um, the main purpose of this report, and it is a very large report at nearly 300 pages, um, it's a comprehensive compilation of the, um, of the main issues uh, related to waste incineration and to provide a, a critical resource Source for environmental justice communities, those frontline communities that carry the burden of industrial pollution in our in any country, and they're around the world mostly uh, lower socioeconomic or communities of colour. So their environmental justice impacts are, are carried. Uh, the biggest burdens are carried by those communities usually that have the least resources to defend themselves. So that's what makes this report so important because it is it, it is the latest compilation of the most up-to-date information on waste incineration, its impacts on health, the environment, uh, our planet, um, and this is critical information, what we would describe as uh, community information systems, which are really important for communities facing these projects in being able to engage with their governments um, to resist these projects. And the, and the types of um, audience that will really benefit from this report, uh, as I said, frontline communities that carry the burden of these projects. They are usually the communities that are the first to raise concerns. They're usually the communities that are the first to engage with their local governments and their decision makers and seek um, scientific support to uh, underpin their campaigns. But as we know, uh, particularly in Australia and uh, around the world, local governments often carry the burden of waste management. And local government um, is usually the place where the, the, there is the least resources and expertise to, uh, to adequately uh, assess these projects and uh, best represent their constituents in making these decisions about waste management. Uh, academic and uh, research organisations will get a lot out of this report as well because it's brought together many, many um, areas, areas of uh, uh, scientific evidence uh, that can inform other research uh, and uh, particularly uh, in academia where uh, certainly in Australia, there's not a high level of awareness of waste incineration. It's not an industry that, that we're dealing with. And so there's not a lot of information in academia and research bodies. Um, and that would be similar uh, in particularly in the global south, because this is, a, this is an industry that is pushing into the global south. And uh, this is uh, what makes this report so important, because as uh, as Nicola and Yindrick have explained, uh, the incinerators operating in the EU um, are being shown, uh, despite being uh, 
uh, compliant or often non-compliant with the EU best practice standards still emit uh, uh, harmful amounts of pollution and cause uh, contamination of the environment. Uh, it's, it, this makes it uh, very important then for the healthcare sector because those host communities carry the burden of the health impacts. But as uh, Nicola and Yindrick have explained, the pollution from incinerators travel well beyond the factory fence line and they represent global pollution impacts, uh, uh, driving the triple planetary crisis, driving the generation of persistent organic pollution, which, as we know, travels globally. It's uh, transboundary, it's bioaccumulative, it, it contaminates the food chain, uh, it gets into the ocean. It, it is a, a global environmental pollution threat. Decision makers, particularly at a state government uh, and federal government uh, level, don't have access to a lot of information. Um, civil society, people in general that want to know about these issues, and particularly environmental organisations. Uh, regulators, of course, are in the hot seat uh, for trying to uh, assess uh, volumes of information which largely come from the incineration industry. And, of course, the media, which uh, are relied upon to report these issues and, and provide due diligence and balance in their stories. And, uh, unfortunately, often it is the case that the uh, information that is before all of these sectors here that I've described is predominantly from the industry themselves. So uh, that's what makes this uh, report so important. It builds on a body of evidence that has come from many organisations around the world that have been studying the impacts of waste incineration, and it provides a very uh, useful uh, decision-making uh, tool for um, those who, who want to know the full impacts of waste incineration. Um, particularly in the Global South, as I said. We know that the EU Commission is recommending to their member states to decommission old incinerators and not build new ones, encouraging them to embrace zero waste policies to support a circular economy. So this industry is looking for new countries to establish, and that's in the Global South, where um, uh, environmental injustices are, are more or more vulnerable uh, because those countries might not have the expertise uh, or the democracies or the ability to uh, assess these projects uh, effectively. Um, so the first chapter in this report, I'm going to quickly just go through this um, the chapters of this report so you know what's in the report. Um, the first chapter is what is incineration and, and in this chapter You'll uh, find summaries of municipal solid waste incineration, hazardous waste incineration, medical waste incineration, gasification and uh, pyrolysis, also known as chemical and advanced recycling. And you'll notice that these uh, two technologies are here because um, they are, in fact, incineration technologies in most cases where the... Uh, the output from these processes is used as a fuel to burn, often known as two-stage incinerators, but we can confirm that both the EU and the US classify these technologies as incinerators when the outputs are used to burn uh, as fuel, as is often the case. The environmental impacts, which uh, uh, Yindrick has gone through uh, quite extensively, include air emissions, emissions to water, residues from waste incineration and, and soil, as well as case studies. It's worth noting here that often the uh, narrative is that you know, incineration is better than landfill, but as um, our, uh, our report shows, uh, incineration doesn't eliminate, eliminate landfill. What it does, in fact, is just reduce the waste uh, volume uh, to a smaller amount, but to a more hazardous waste stream, which then requires secure landfill as a hazardous waste. So incineration is not a solution for landfill. It, in fact, inherently requires hazardous waste landfilling. Uh, the following chapter is, oops, sorry about that. Um, I'm having trouble reading my own slide because the uh, um, incinerators and the planetary uh, ecosystems 
which covered climate change, chemical pollution, novel entities, as Yindrick has covered, biodiversity and the biogeochemical uh, bio flows of phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, really important aspects of this report because we know one of the most simplest and effective waste management uh, practices is to isolate organic waste from the municipal waste stream, from all waste streams actually, and not send it to landfill. Uh, uh, methane in landfill is generated from uh, sorry methane in landfill is generated from uh, the degradation of organic waste. If we don't put organic waste in landfill, then we are vastly reducing the generation of methane. Um, what you'll find is uh, uh, incinerator proponents and their lobbyists and oftentimes governments as well um, suggest that incineration is much better than landfill because it doesn't produce methane. But it, it, it assumes that we are sending organic waste to landfill and that's not the case in Australia. We have a national policy uh, and state policies to remove uh, uh, organic waste from landfill, and um, so do many other countries, and they're, they're very capable of doing that. Uh, goodness knows our biosphere needs that carbon more than our atmosphere needs. So uh, composting is a, a critical part of a sustainable waste management system. It's extremely important, and um, we can replace some of these more industry and energy-intensive uh, um ways of uh, creating fertiliser and phosphorus and, and nitrogen for the agricultural sector if we more fully embraced um, uh, composting our organic waste instead of sending it to landfill. Toxic substances, incinerators, their flows and their health impacts is the next chapter and this covers persistent organic pollutants. Um, many of them are listed there, other organic substances uh, and heavy metals. Uh, the following chapter is the impacts of incineration on human health um, and accidents. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of seconds here to talk about the impacts of incineration on human health because I know that it's one of the more worrying aspects of incinerator proposals for uh, environmental justice communities. Um, it's a very difficult uh, a topic to discuss because there's uh, conflicting information. But in summary, uh, early on, uh, around 2001, uh, a very uh, report by Greenpeace uh, highlighted incinerator impacts. Um, this was very challenging for the industry. There was some pushback um, about that. And uh, sin since that time, there have been uh, many studies that have showed uh, uh, human health impacts associated with with the incinerators, but also some studies that have shown uh, no impacts. Uh, what's really important is to look at who is generating the science and, and, and have due regard for those studies that are uh, have vested interests and bias that may be coming from industry themselves and maybe not uh, using a, uh, a, a um, appropriate methodology. Um, more recently, though, um, I'm just going to refer to the systematic review that was undertaken by an Australian uh, academic, uh, Peter Tate. This was for the Australian Public Health Association, the um, uh, Australian National University and the Council of Academic Public Health Institute. Um, they have carried out what I, I believe is the only uh, systematic review of public health impacts on incineration. Um, they looked at 93 manuscripts. Of that, 61% found significant health impacts associated with incinerator uh, pollution. Um, they further went on to conclude that there was a strong association uh, of health impacts from incinerators associated with uh, reproductive outcomes, uh, preterm births, congenital abnormalities, um, uh, um, that, and neoplasia. They were the strongest uh, health associations. Uh, this a systematic review, though, uh, was only conducted for English-speaking um, uh, studies, and uh, it highlighted the urgent, uh, the lack of any global health study for this sector, which is quite astounding in and of itself. Um, but it concluded that, based on the precautionary principle, 
uh, it was insufficient evidence to conclude that any incinerator was safe. Uh, it really is the case we live in a world where there's lots of pollution sources. It's very difficult to prove causation um, and we rely on epidemiolog epidemiological studies to uh, give us the information that we're seeking. It's an imperfect, uh, imperfect world that we're living in. But clearly, um, if we consider uh, the known pollution and growing evidence of pollution impacts and we know the profile of these contaminants, we know the pathways, the systemic review highlighted specifically that ingestion was a significant pathway for um, exposure, yet it's poorly uh, studied. So uh, the impacts of uh, incineration on uh, human health, you can find in this chapter. And uh, in this chapter, you'll find table 6.1, which uh, provides a really good summary of all the scientific studies that found an association uh, with uh, health impacts. Uh, the chapter itself, though, is very balanced and uh, identifies uh, also those studies that didn't find any impacts. Following that chapter, you'll find the chapter on accidents. And this is a really important uh, chapter as well because um, uh, this is a this is a real uh, part of the industry. They catch fire, they explode. There are fires and explosions associated with this industry. And as we uh, watch the rise in plastic production and consumption, um, and without adequate plastic waste, uh, we're going to see more uh, fire risk and explosion risks. Certainly in Australia, we've had some of the worst plastic fire uh, risks and uh, facility uh, storage facility explosions that, that we've had ever. Um, it's, a, it's a growing concern and this really should be articulated to the decision makers when they're uh, making decisions about whether they're going to site these uh, facilities. There we go, sorry. Uh, alternatives to incineration. So um, when we're talking about uh, incineration, um, we really should, and in most cases, we're talking about residual waste. And residual waste should be uh, what we can't compost, what we can't recycle, what we can't reuse. Um, really, it should be all the things that we can't do anything better with. When I talk to my colleagues in, in Europe, they say, if you can collect a waste, in most cases, you can do something better with it than landfill it or incinerate it. And that really is the case. So the key to avoiding incineration and landfill is to address the issue of residual waste. If you look at residual waste, those things that can't be recycled because they contain toxic substances, they're composite materials, um, they can't be easily separated, um, and plastic recycling really is uh, um, a really good example of that. Um, so, um, but there's a lot we can do, and there's a lot of hope. And there is a lot of work in this area, which is very inspiring, particularly in Europe with uh, the, the um, examples of their successful zero waste city models. Um, and you can find their reports on, on uh, their website. Uh, we know uh, uh, from uh, experts in the field of a circular economy, you might recall or, or might know of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, who clearly identify landfill and incineration as leakages from the circular economy. So while there is a narrative out there being pushed by industry that incineration is part of the circular economy, uh, this report firmly uh, confirms that that is not the case. Incineration can never be part of the circular economy because it's a linear process. Uh, uh, those resources are lost forever uh, to the atmosphere as uh, toxic pollution and greenhouse gases and the hazardous waste ash left over is a legacy that uh, future generations will have to deal with. It is certainly not a solution. And um, alternatives to incineration are uh, cheaper, more effective, provide more jobs, and they're safer for our climate and our community. 
The economics and financial aspects of waste incineration are the next chapter and includes investment in construction, maintenance and repairs, operating costs and waste incineration fees, associated costs and fees and unaccounted costs associated with waste incineration. Uh, over capacity of, uh, of waste incineration, um, well, this map speaks a thousand words. Um, there are numerous uh, incinerators um, all throughout Europe where Europe has really uh, relied on incineration for uh, district heating and other reasons originally. Um, um, but uh, we are burning more waste than uh, we can regenerate those finite uh, materials. So we're really uh, selling, kicking the can down the road and selling out uh, the rights of future generations to access those materials. Um, this chapter includes uh, the global capacity of waste incineration, case studies from Europe and challenges in, in China's waste uh, sector. Waste incineration and civil society is where you'll find the case studies from Spain, Ireland, China, Portugal, South Africa, the Czech Republic, India, Malaysia and Australia. And uh, and then you'll find the final summary. So I'm I know that I have probably gone well over. Apologies for that, um, but I uh, just want to congratulate all the other authors to this report and everyone that's joined today. This is one of the most compelling issues facing our planet. Um, our waste represents our entire uh, materials production systems, how we grow our food, how we make the materials we use, and how we dispose of them. And if we continue to burn them and waste them, there'll be, there is not going to be anything left for future generations. And we are going to pollute our planet um, uh, with the most dangerous pollutants in existence. And uh, I hope that this report really helps all those environmental justice communities that are facing these projects, provides them with the case studies, the evidence that they need to challenge uh, those um, industries and to be able to make meaningful, substantive and reliable contributions to the environmental impact assessment uh, processes that are, if you're lucky enough, in a country to be afforded that. If not, this is a report that the decision makers uh, need to read carefully and uh, fully consider. So thank you very much. And I believe I'm going to hand over to Griffins. Yes, thanks a lot, Jane. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, uh, for, for, for the presentations. Thank you very much and uh, very insightful. Um, Griffin Sucheng from Center for Environment, Justice and Development, uh, based in Nairobi, uh, currently in Abidjan for Africa Ministerial Meeting. I just want to uh, share our experience, uh, particularly the work we're doing uh, with regard to uh, addressing toxic chemicals uh, and also some experiences with regard to the situation in, um, in my country and uh, broadly within Africa. Uh, I really congratulate the speakers for for and the report uh, that has been presented, uh, which has highlighted uh, the challenges that uh, you know currently come for this type of technology in handling waste. Uh, Africa has a big challenge in waste management, and there's been uh, you know uh, as as Jane put it, you know uh, proposals of push uh, lobbyists on uh, ad, uh, in putting up incinerators, particularly in municipality or in, 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 in landfills or dump sites uh, to address the issue of waste management, which is becoming a big challenge. So just speaking from um, in terms of our views and uh, highlighting some examples, uh, particularly from Kenya, uh, from what Jane has just spoken about, uh, we view also that, uh, you know, the issue of incineration is just a continued linear mistake that uh, we, we need to avoid, particularly in, in, in the global South countries, because it perpetuates the continued U.S. generation and the need to have to be able to continue to provide uh, ways to, to these technologies in order to uh, meet uh, maybe the goal for their investments. 
so it it undermines the circular approaches uh in line with the waste hierarchy that uh for instance in 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 Kenya where we have changed our policy and law to focus on uh, uh transitioning from linear to circular economy uh, in in terms of uh management of waste so this does not mention uh the issue of waste uh, incineration but encourages uh particularly the waste separation uh which uh, and uh, handling uh, at household level and also uh you know uh, issues of material recovery facility which gives opportunities uh, for many waste pickers that are many many developing countries uh to to engage uh, they are already contributing uh to the extent they are able to form in the in, in an informal manner in terms of recycling or collection and, and sorting of waste and so with these material recovery facilities uh it it, it gives opportunities for 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 them but that is uh with regard to this handling the situation as it were uh at the moment uh with shifting of policies uh and laws uh it also in terms of incineration has uh, ecological challenges which has already been highlighted uh, about climate change and uh, plastic pollution where we need to be more efficient uh, in terms of the use of resources and shifting from this so-called uh, self-disposal perspective to upstream measures uh, in order to address um, the challenges of enormous uh, plastic pollution impact, uh, which has also been highlighted. Uh, in terms of um, effects uh, onto human health, uh, we have partnered with Anika and uh, IPEN in studies that has also shown the levels of dioxins and furans, particularly from fly ash uh, that results from uh, incineration. We only currently have incineration for medical waste, uh, inf incineration facilities for medical waste, but none for, for municipal solid waste. But there has been uh, effort or push uh, by lobbyists to have this waste to energy plants uh, on incinerators uh, in cities like Nairobi. Uh, however, has been presented in this report that has more than negative effects than any uh, positive uh, effect that uh, we'll be able to talk about. Um, it has been mentioned that it, it has incineration has higher greenhouse gas emissions uh, than the scenario of waste collection or mixed waste sorting and landfilling. Uh, it is no net energy uh, effect, uh, net energy from, from this uh, type of technology. It only recovers a fraction of uh, energy by combustion. So, uh, has been alluded uh, by earlier presenters, so that provides a uh, challenge for for this issue. Uh, our laws uh, in Kenya, particularly encourages, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, waste hierarchy, in terms of prevention, and uh, that that, in my view, is is uh, requires a shift that will uh, do not require or do not lead to the need for waste incinerators uh, in, in, in global South country and particularly in, in Kenya. Also, I think has been mentioned, uh, you know, for instance, in, in the situation in Africa where we have many uh, informal waste pickers that are aching or have jobs uh, from, from the engagement in waste collection and sorting and, and the promotion of recycling. Uh, this will deny them or take away the jobs uh, of the waste pickers uh, themselves when you put up these plants uh, that will be run uh, uh, or investors that will put them up, denying the job opportunities for the many waste pickers that are working to promote sustainable waste management in, in an informal manner. Uh, it's also the most expensive waste treatment system uh, in terms of construction for countries uh, or economies like uh, Africa or Kenya, where I'm from, in terms of, for instance, collection costs, uh, maintenance and operation, uh, and even monitoring uh, of, of, of the auxins or the emissions uh, that will need to come in order to protect communities. And uh, with the challenges in capacity or, or uh, both technical capacity and uh, resources to conduct this monitoring. It only opens uh, opportunity for more exposure of communities to these uh, toxic chemicals. So it, it's very, very um, expensive uh, waste treatment system, as well as also the issue of pollution, air, both air and ash pollution residue disposals. Uh, we are not having... Uh, a good facility for handling of hazardous waste. Uh, this is 
still a, a big challenge in many countries, including my country, where, uh, for instance, uh, you, you find because of this uh, as other's nature, uh, there the, 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 the is no proper environmentally sound management of some of these other's waste uh, that comes from, uh, you know, waste generated. And uh, and so this uh, becomes very expensive, uh, you know, the in terms of health burden uh, of communities that are exposed uh, to this uh, kind of technology. Um, uh, uh, there's also the locking effect uh, from you know this technology uh, where you have to have uh, pay put or pay contracts uh, where, for instance, city of Nairobi would supply or fixed in a contract uh, for a period. Uh, which they will pay, it it basically undermines the waste reduction or recycling and composting programs that uh, would, uh, you know, give opportunities for engagement of many waste pickers uh, and others. Uh, it also undermines future reduction of waste, uh, reduction which we are calling for when you're looking at uh, how to manage uh, solid waste where we need to promote uh, waste minimization uh, and, and prevention in the first place uh, and the handling based on a circular economy approaches uh, that uh, would address the challenges in, in our region. So just reflecting uh, from this report, uh, just in my short uh, remarks, uh, is that uh, it's, it's a very insightful report, which I think is critical for our policymakers in our region to be able to uh, make informed uh, choices uh, in terms of how we develop our policies in handling waste, uh, which is becoming a major challenge, and focus on upstream measures uh, that need to be, uh, you know, focused on uh, up, uh, currently happening as well in in in, in the negotiations of, of a plastic treaty, and then there will need for there will be no need for uh, you know this type of technologies uh, that will be needed to address the issue of waste in, in our countries so i really appreciate the opportunity to share these experiences and uh, also very thankful for the, uh, the all the authors and presenters that have brought this uh, very important issue uh, when it comes to the human health and the environment thank you very much Thank you very much. Uh, so this was the fourth and the final presentation from our side.